Good evening, and welcome to Otis Jerry's Creepypasta Crypt. In the mood for a tasty pasta to increase your adrenaline rush. Well, you've come to the right place. Pull up a chair, get some popcorn, put your feet up, and have a listen, if you dare. <laughs> The Catacomb by Peter Shilston Narrated by Otis Jiry I'm retelling this story as it was told to me. Imagine, if you can, a coach making a tour of the island of Sicily in the middle of August, carrying a couple of dozen English package holidaymakers on the usual lightning inspection of places of interest. Palermo in two days... Agrigento in another two, Syracuse meriting only one, a trip by chairlift up Mount Etna and then home. The sort of people one finds on such tours are invariably the same. A number of school teachers, earnest retired couples, parents who have inappropriately brought children and are beginning to wonder why they didn't save themselves trouble by going to the beach instead, and a handful of single unattached people. Furthermore, their behavior is always the same. Some spend all their time grumbling at the quality of the hotels and food. The younger men wonder why there are no available attractive young ladies on the tour. The children get bored. And the school teachers carry guidebooks and maps around everywhere and take enormous numbers of photographs. Others seem to show no interest in the historical sites at all, and spend all their time either sitting in the nearest café or buying various unpleasant souvenirs. This particular coach party was a typical one, I think. Among its members was a certain Mr. Pearsall, a quiet, solitary, middle-aged man of vaguely scholarly appearance. He had enjoyed the tour and had been duly impressed by the Greek temples of Agrigento and the mosaics in the great cathedral at Marial but he had not managed to make close friends of any of the other passengers, and now that the holiday had only a couple of days left to run, he was looking forward to getting back home again. Consequently, he was mildly irritated when old Mrs. Tavistock, in the back of the coach, started to complain of stomach pains. She had been something of a moaner throughout the tour, but now she was looking genuinely ill with the result that Giuliano, the courier, had to ask the driver to stop in the next town so that a doctor could be brought. The next town turned out to be a nondescript settlement nestling beneath an enormous cliff, with little apart from this huge overshadowing presence to distinguish it from any of one of fifty other small towns that they had already passed through on the tour. Here Giuliano went in search of a medical man, leaving his charges dozing, idly reading their books or making desultory conversation. It was mid-afternoon, and the sun was blazing fiercely. All sensible Sicilians were indoors, having a siesta. Shutters were down on every window, and not a soul was visible in the street. After a while, Giuliana returned, and regretted to inform them that they would have to wait at least an hour for Mrs. Tavistock to receive attention before they could proceed. In the meantime, they could get out and stretch their legs, though it was unlikely that they would find anywhere open. The coach would sound its horn to call them back when it was time to go. Here he engaged in an animated conversation in Italian with Umberto, the driver, who made many emphatic gestures, the upshot of which was some more unencouraging information. The local people, said Giuliano, kept themselves very much to themselves, and there were really no facilities for tourists at all. No coaches normally stopped there, and there was little point in trying to explore the town. Really, it had nothing to offer. He expressed his regret again, and had a few more words with Umberto. Mr. Pirasol's command of Italian was not great, but he seemed to detect the phrase, "'Can't come to much harm if they're all together.' Mr. Pirasol, however, did not intend to stay with the others as they stood around on the pavement in a pointless fashion. 
He had glimpsed a church down a side street as they drove into town. It had looked old and surprisingly large for such an insignificant place, and thought it might just be worth an exploratory visit. The harm Giuliano had mentioned, assuming he had understood him right, he took to mean thieves. They had been warned to be aware of bag snatchers in the major cities, but it was hardly likely that gangs of muggers would bother to patrol a town where no tourists ever stopped. The streets seemed absolutely deserted. Besides, Mr. Pearsall was still quite fit, and he imagined he could hold his own against the average thief, or at the very worst, run fast enough to get away. So, taking his camera, he imparted his intended destination to a fellow passenger, who showed not the slightest inclination to accompany him, and set out at a brisk pace. The side streets of the town were very narrow, and ran steeply up the hill toward the great beating overhang of the cliff. Some of them had steps in them. Mr. Pearsall wondered how claustrophobic it would be to live beneath that great black shadow, and also speculated whether the town was ever damaged by rock falls. After a couple of turns into dead ends, he found himself in a little gravel-strewn square, as devoid of people as the rest of town, facing the church itself. A glance at the sun told him that he was approaching it from the west end. The southeastern corner of it almost touched the base of the cliff, because it had exactly the same color and texture as the towering mass, the church gave the slightly disturbing impression of having been carved by the hand of a giant in a single piece out of the living rock. His first sensation, Mr. Pearsall tells us, was of great age and general dilapidation. The church looked far older than the Doric temples at Agrigento, and which he had admired earlier in the week, though his intellect told him this could not possibly be the case. He supposed it must be a Norman building, though possibly on an older foundation, Arabic or even Roman. The style was typical enough, though rather ill-proportioned. Two squat, heavy towers with hardly any windows, and those very small, and flanked a portico of three large pointed arches, what little decoration there had ever been was now barely discernible. There seemed at one time to have been fresco paintings inside the portico, but now the plaster was badly cracked, and in some places fallen away entirely. Only a dim few outlines of human figures, presumably saints, could be discovered. There was a large wooden door, decayed and worm-eaten, with panels carved in what had once been ornate abstract patterns. Moorish influence, said Mr. Pearsall to himself, and tried the door. It was locked. This was predictable under the circumstances, but still annoying. Mr. Pearsall retreated to the square to take a picture, and then looked at his watch. A mere fifteen minutes had passed since he left the coach, and he still had plenty of time to kill. The day was hotter than ever, and if there was any shops in this godforsaken place, they were resolutely shut. He decided to stroll round outside the church, for sure lack of anything else to do. Besides, he would be in the shade for a part of the walk, and it would be cooler. Without any great enthusiasm, he set out. He was a mild-tempered man, but if there was one thing that caused him irritation— it was suddenly finding himself with nothing whatsoever to do when he had expected to be occupied. Along the south side of the church, the shuttered houses ran so close that the street was more like a tunnel. He had not gone far when he noticed a small side door. It should cause us no great surprise that he tried to open it, and much to his gratification, found it was not locked. Surprised at his good fortune, and congratulating himself on his persistence, he went inside. At first, there was nothing to be seen, so dark was the interior after the savagery of the afternoon glare outside. But soon, Mr. Pearsall's eyes had grown accustomed to the gloom, and he was able to look around him. He knew at once that his walk had been worthwhile. In his tidy fashion, he began to classify what he could see a long, high nave with aisles on either side, clearly another Norman church, 
with the pointed arches learned from the Arabs. But, unlike some of the others he had seen on his visit, this church had not been revamped later on in the Baroque period. There was not a Corinthian pilaster to be seen. The capitals of the columns seemed to be a mass of grotesque carvings, but were so thick with grime that he could not distinguish them clearly. Indeed, the whole interior was very dirty. The pews were thick with dust, and the candles so discolored that they looked as if they had not been lit in years. Clearly, they were expecting no visitors, for there was not a guidebook or a postcard visible anywhere. Then Mr. Pearsall saw the mosaics. He had already been initiated into the marvels which the Normans had bequeathed to Sicily in this field, in such staggering compilations as the Cathedral of Montreal and the Palatine Chapel in Palermo. But even so, the examples of the art on display at this out-of-the-way place quite took his breath away. Here, some nameless craftsmen of the twelfth century had taken the Byzantine style and interpreted it with a vigor and liveliness that were all his own. A veritable poor man's Bible of astonishing power covered the walls. Mr. Parasol quite forgot the passing of time as he followed the treasures on display. Here was the creation of the world in a sequence of seven pictures— there were Adam and Eve, tempted by the serpent and expelled from paradise. More scenes followed. Cain murdering Abel, the building of the ark, the drunkenness of Noah, the Tower of Babel, Abram and the destruction of the cities of Plain, the sacrifice of Isaac, on and on, each one more startling than the last. How odd, thought Mr. Pearsall, as he moved from scene to scene, full of wonder and admiration that the inhabitants of this town should discourage tourists. Here they had some of the finest mosaics on the island, if not in the whole of Italy, and yet they were left to decay out of sight in a locked and dirty church. Why, with just a little initiative and energy from the town's authorities, visitors would surely come flocking to see such marvels? Did they object to the very idea of tourists? Surely there were enough prospective café owners and postcard dealers in the place to insist that something was done. And why was the church not mentioned in any of the guidebooks, which he had read so assiduously before starting on his tour? Such were the musings that passed through Mr. Pearsall's mind, but after a while began to have doubts. It became noticeable that, though the artist had great natural vigor, it was the portrayal of evil which called forth his finest efforts. A serpent in the Garden of Eden, for instance, was given a human face that bore a sinister and seductive lair. In the story of Cain and Abel, there was no doubt that it was Cain who was intended as the hero, for Abel, as he lay helpless on the ground, was a mere hapless simpleton, whereas his murderer, standing over him with a spade raised to cleave his skull, was full of savage power. King Nimrod's soldiers of Babel looked like mindless automata. The picture of Saul and the Witch of Endor, which was situated in the darkest corner of the church, perhaps deliberately, was covered with cobwebs. After examining it closely, Mr. Pearsall was almost glad of this, for inside the witch's cave were certain unpleasant non-human shapes that were perhaps, well, left unseen. Perhaps the artist was a Manichaean. Here's Mr. Pearsall, uh, a Cathar, or an Abigensian. Or are they the same thing? Have I got the dates right? More convinced of the existence of evil than of good. Perhaps his mosaics were condemned as heretical. But in that case, why weren't they destroyed instead of just closing the church down? Now I wonder what he's made of the New Testament. Their mosaics were even more unsettling. Mr. Pearsall could not find an enunciation or even a nativity, but there was a quite horribly realistic massacre of the innocents, in which a number of ingenious and disgusting means had been devised of slaughtering the children, while King Herod sat on his throne overlooking the carnage and laughed. The portrayal of Judas receiving his thirty pieces of silver from Caiaphas, 
would have stood as one of the artistic masterpieces of all time, were it not so exceedingly unpleasant. And so it progressed, through various nasty portrayals of people possessed by devils, through the stories of Simon Magnus and Ananias, both of whom, once again, were the most vivid characterizations in their particular scenes, right up to a terrifyingly powerful portrayal of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. By this time, not only was Mr. Pearsall distinctly upset by the mosaics, but he was feeling increasingly ill at ease. At first, the church had been completely silent, but as time went on, it seemed full of little noises he could not locate. His footsteps echoed round and round in a long diminuendo, but they seemed to be answered by odd rustlings and creakings. No doubt these were the normal sounds of rodent life or of aged woodwork at the start of its death throes, but when, like Mr. Pearsall, one is alone in an ancient church in the middle of a strange town, where not a single human inhabitant is yet shown his face, and when, furthermore, one is surrounded by the most disturbing illustrations of biblical evil, such rational explanations carry distinctly less force. Once or twice he held his breath and stood perfectly still to see if the noises continued. Not only that, he also increasingly felt he was being watched. Probably it was only the faces in the mosaics that caused this, but on more than one occasion he thought he saw a movement right in the corner of his field of vision, and whirled around in alarm only to find nothing. Finally, he came to a Virgin Mary who was quite devoid of the usual serenity, but instead had the voluptuousness of a vampire. So appalling was her expression that he thought for a while she must be a portrayal of the scarlet whore of Babylon. But no, she had the posture and the usual clothing of the Virgin, and there in her arms was the Christ child a hideous infant with an oily and sanctimonious grin, which put Mr. Pearsall in mind of a satiated appetite for something perverse. He shuddered and was filled with a sensation of such acute distaste that for a moment he forgot the noises. All this time he had avoided looking at the east end, intending to keep till last his viewing of what was always the glory of the Sicilian churches, the great figure of Christ in the apse above the altar. Now he could keep from it no longer, and turned his gaze in that direction. It was indeed a masterpiece, in spite of the dirt and the cobwebs that encrusted it. As usual, Christ's head and shoulders were portrayed, robed in red and blue, the right arm extending in blessing, the left holding an open book lettered in Greek. The treatment of the material by the unknown artist was marvelous, but the expression on Christ's face was uniquely horrible. A malignant sneer of contempt. The eyes were very piercing. Mr. Pearsall could not read Greek, but he suspected that the words written on the open page of the book were hardly a normal scriptural text and the right hand. Was that the usual gesture of blessing, or was it the first and last fingers held up, the gesture known as the devil's horns? This is a blasphemous church, said Mr. Pearsall to himself. The mosaics may be very fine, but they are also very horrible. Some bishop, perhaps even the pope, condemned them and had the church closed down. Even the townspeople don't like to talk about them, because they are still a very religious people. They don't let tourists in. Just as well. These pictures are enough to give anyone nightmares. Well, I'm glad I've seen them, but it's not a pleasant place to visit on your own, and I can't say I'll be sorry to leave. He glanced at his watch and was almost relieved to find that his hour had practically expired. It gave him an excuse to leave without exploring the rest of the church. With a brisk walk that an unsympathetic observer might have thought perilously close to panic-stricken run, he turned away toward the south door by which he had entered. But now it was locked. For some time Mr. Pearsall struggled in quiet, futile fashion, shaking the door, twisting the iron ring this way and that, 
searching for a cat, but he was entirely unable to shift it. He thumped on the door with the palm of his hand and kicked it, and a great ringing boom echoed round the church like a salvo of cannon fire. And to this day he swears that from somewhere there came a kind of sinister chuckle in answer. With a considerable effort, he pulled himself together. This is stupid, he told himself. There's probably some custodian who forgot to lock the church up before his siesta and only realized his mistake when he woke up. But he must be a very careless or stupid man, or he would have checked to see if anyone had gone inside. All the same, he did not want to knock again and risk that dreadful echo, so he decided to search for another door that might be open. Logic suggested that there should be one on the north side, perhaps opening to a cloister or something similar. Crossing the nave with a certain trepidation and carefully avoiding a glance at that blasphemous figure of Christ, though he imagined he could sense the cruel eyes bearing on him with an almost tangible force, he went in search. Sure enough, there was a door in the corner of the north side, and it was not locked, though it seemed a long time since it had been opened. A strong thrust was needed to shift it, and it groaned horribly as it swung inward, dislodging a shower of dirt. A peculiar, musty smell seeped into the air. Mr. Pearsall found himself peering at a flight of worn stone steps, running downward into the darkness. Now this did not look like the way out at all. Indeed, the smell suggested that the lower chamber, whatever it was, was completely sealed from the outer air, and had been so for a very long time. It was a most unpromising route for one wishing to leave the building, and to this day Mr. Pearsall has never been able to give a satisfactory explanation of why he decided to descend those steps. He was already late, and after the unsettling effect of the mosaics, most of his exploratory zeal had evaporated, but nonetheless he could not resist the lure of a doorway. He wondered afterwards whether he was in full control of his movements any more. The whole place bore a distinctly sinister air, but still he had to push the door fully open and take his first tentative steps into the darkness. The stairs were long and curiously dank in spite of the dryness of the climate. Soon, all trace of the light of the main body of the church, which had itself seemed so gloomy when he first had entered, had been lost, and he was obliged to take his cigarette lighter from his pocket and proceed by its flickering illumination. He turned a corner beneath a glowing archway of uncut stone, descended a ramp, and gasped at what he saw. It was a catacomb. A long corridor opened before him, with side passages running from it. Perhaps the whole area beneath the nave was covered, and it was inhabited. A long line doubled of human forms stood along each passage. All ages and classes had their representatives here. Men and women and infants, monks and warriors, learned scholars and ladies of fashion. They were dressed in clothes that must once have been their finest, furs and silks and embroidered gowns, now sadly moldering and decayed, but bearing still a glimmer of their former glories. And they had faces, for clearly much ingenuity had been expended to preserve the bodies, though with mixed degrees of success. There was a girl child whose clothing looked at least two hundred years old, but who, from her skin and hair, might just have fallen asleep. But beyond her, a man in priestly robes had lost his nose and his cheeks, and his eyes had decayed to blank, milky globules, and further on the soldier in the chased steel breastplate, who was perhaps a mercenary from the Renaissance period, had lost his flesh entirely, and now grinned mindlessly with a naked skull. Poor Mr. Pearsall! The effect would have been quite nasty enough under bright electric lights and surrounded by his fellow tourists, but here, on his own, locked in, and after already being alarmed and upset by those hideous mosaics, and furthermore with just a single weak flame to protect him from the darkness, the shock was overwhelming. Quite why did he not turn and bolt, he has never managed to explain. He takes refuge in mysterious talk of feeling a call, which dragged him onwards. 
Certainly it is irrefutable that he walked on down the passage, through the grisly ranks of the dead, horror mounting within him, but quite unable to save himself. All the bodies had been there a very long time. Mr. Pearsall's knowledge of the history of costume was not great, but he was fairly certain that none of the garments worn could be placed any later than the middle eighteenth century, and the majority seemed to be medieval. What was left of his rational mind told him that similar catacombs were not unknown elsewhere, but such a piece of information seemed extraordinarily useless. As he walked onward, he appeared to be moving back steadily in time toward the very Middle Ages. Very few of the faces had any flesh on them by this time. Some were left almost naked, their clothing in flimsy rags, and others had simply fallen and lay in heaps on the floor. But still he had to go onward until he reached the end. He had lost all sense of direction by now, but suspected he was moving beneath the altar, beneath the Christ of the devil's horns, blessings, and the malevolent glance. And here was the center of this labyrinth of death, a great throne of gilded wood, much rotted, where sat a body clad in this gorgeous robes and mitre of a bishop. This much Mr. Pearsall took in at a distance, but as he drew near, he would not look at the figure directly. He tried to force his eyes to look only at the slippers. He was sure he would lose his reason if he looked higher, but he could not fight as a force stronger than his mind raised his head gradually higher, the gold-embroidered coat, the skeletal hands with the episcopal ring loosely enclosing a bony finger, the crozier propped up in the other hand, the bones of the face bare of all flesh, the grinning yellow teeth, the eyes, the eyes, not decayed at all, but alive, piercing, glaring. My God! The same eyes as Christ in the mosaic. The lighter fell from Mr. Pearsall's nerveless grasp, and he plunged into darkness. It was a lighter of cylindrical shape, and he had heard it roll away, tinkling, out of his reach. For a few seconds he scrabbled uselessly on the floor for it, then realized how pointless such a search was. He would have to find his way out in total darkness. How far was it? How many turns had he taken? He waved his arms in front and to either side, walked a few paces, touched stone, turned, walked more until he met another obstacle, turned again. It was at this stage that he began to hear noises again, a horrible, dry rustling which he would have loved to think was a rat. It came from behind him. He moved quicker and walked slap into one of the bodies. His face buried itself into the rotting fabric, and he felt the lifeless arm slump across his shoulders. His nerves snapped entirely, and he screamed. A muffled noise, quickly extinguished. He ran at random, hitting another body, and ran again and struck another. Corpses were collapsing all around him, but still there was a rustling and a padding and a dry, gravelly cackling behind him, and it, too, was moving, not fast, but soon it would reach him if he could not find the stairs. He fell and cut his hands and screamed again, but not from pain. He lost count of how many times he smashed into obstacles until, bruised and bleeding, he could go no further, and cowered back against the stone wall. The rustling was quite close now. Light. He must have light. He had lost his cigarette lighter. He had no matches. Frantically, his hands searched his pockets for a miracle. Of course, he had flash cubes for his camera. With trembling fingers, he pulled one out and fiddled for what seemed an eternity to fit it into place. He pressed the shutter button and nothing happened. A dud. He turned it round and tried once more. Still nothing. The rustling was only inches away. Think, man, think. He had forgotten to wind on the film, so of course nothing would happen. Pull round the winding lever and try again. Just time. 
In the blinding instantaneous moment he saw, not more than a yard from his face, the golden robe, the mitre, the skull, and the eyes, the terrible eyes. He must have fainted. When he awoke, it was bright daylight, and he was lying on the back seat of the couch. Giuliano was leaning over him. The courier had been told where Mr. Pearsall had gone, and when he failed to return on time, Giuliano and Umberto had gone to the church to find him. Entering by the south door, which they emphatically denied was locked, they heard his screams from the crypt and saw the flash. They found him without much difficulty. He was within yards of the steps. Giuliano was more relieved than anyone, but he chided Mr. Pearsall for disturbing the bodies in the catacomb. Banging into them in the dark was careless and destructive, but as for deliberately dragging one body all the way from its resting place, and it being the body of a bishop, too? Mr. Pearsall did not have the strength to argue. Hi, Otis Gyrie here. Thanks for joining me around the digital campfire today. Your support means everything to me. I wanted to take a moment to ask you to support me and help me make storytelling my career by joining the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights members area. There are links in the video description below. If you love what I do, help me make this my full-time job by signing up for any membership of your choice. With your support, I can quit my day job and dedicate my day to putting out more twisted tales more regularly and take more of your requests. With a membership, not only do you get instant access to my archive of 200 plus audio stories in HD format, but you'll get them weeks or months before the public does. You'll also get access to the full archive of hundreds of fully produced Chilling Tales for Dark Nights tales, including several narrated by me, and advanced access there as well. In addition to that, you get exclusive members-only access to private monthly livestream events and direct access to me and the rest of the team.